Here we go. And so good evening, folks, and welcome back to the page, Astronomy by the Bay. It's Chris Kerwin here, and I have with me tonight uh, Mr. Mike Powell from St. John, PFO Observatory. And we have uh, Paul Owen from Moonshadow Observatory. Welcome, guys. Hello. Hey. And tonight uh, we're going to do a little bit of a talk about uh, some 3D printing. Uh, Mike has a 3D printer, so Mike is going to offer us uh, some ideas on what to do with a 3D printer. We all know that it's uh, really expensive uh, to use uh, or to find telescope accessories. Uh, anytime I'm looking for them, I'm on eBay and Amazon and everywhere else, and I'm usually looking at a site called Astro Vicel for little specific accessories. And uh, we've all found that accessories can re usually end up costing us probably three or four times as much as, te as a telescope that we purchased. So uh, they're, they're a really uh, good idea to be able to 3D print them if we can. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about 3D printing. Mike's got a presentation here for us. And then Paul's going to give us a talk on uh, cameras and uh, what cameras you should use uh, at what times. So uh, basically shooting the moon and planets and stuff or, or versus deep sky, uh, what, will be, uh, what we should be offering for cameras in those cases. Uh, then hopefully we'll get enough time at the end of it that I'll be able to uh, offer a talk on what's coming up in, uh, in the month of March. So I've got a few slides on some really nice planet conjunctions coming up this month. Uh, the moon is going to join the planets really nicely. Uh, so we've got a pretty good uh, full show, I guess. Cloudy skies here in St. John. Peter says cloudy in Toronto as well. Well, Peter, we got it here in Atlantic Canada too. Um, uh, so we, uh, at this particular hour at least, uh, we decided to go ahead with just a, a show without uh, live view. Hopefully we'll get... Uh, an opportunity to offer some live views here before our show ends for the season and we're expecting that's going to be within a couple of weeks time um, now next uh, next Sunday is the uh, is the spring forward time so we move ahead one hour next Sunday which means that it's going to be a, a little bit longer for us to get uh, a night sky uh, possibility so if we find out that by next week uh, we all the only thing that we can offer is maybe the moon and then a planet or two then we'll have to uh, stop uh, for uh, for the season and start up again uh, in the fall but that was what we expected anyway uh, we did expect that uh, that we wouldn't be running the show uh, year-round simply because we can't because of the climate that we're in and, and, the, and the season that's coming up but it was basically to uh, give you a little bit of a tease to get you out to the eyepiece because that's uh, that's our goal this is eyeballs to eyepieces so um, in the meantime we're going to offer a program here tonight so I guess we're going to start it with Mike. If you would, Mike, uh, share your screen and give us some ideas on some 3D printing uh, telescope accessories that you've done. All righty. Good evening, everybody. Let me go uh, over to you. Let me up there. Share on here. I quickly throw this up because it's my moment. <laughs> it certainly is. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome to my world, as they say. <laughs> so, I'm on the screen here. Uh, 3D printing in astronomy it was kind of funny uh, how I come across this. Uh, my son, living in my basement, one day got a box in the mail, and I said, what's that? He goes, a 3D printer. And I said, oh, yes, one of those things you can run down to the library and print a keychain. And I thought that's about all you could do with it. But uh, I went down one day, and he had this whole 3D printed skull sitting there, and I thought, wow, that is pretty awesome. And I said, where do you get the plans for that? And he said, there's a place called Thingiverse. And he went on his website, and I said, type in telescope. And when he did that, the old cogs and wheels and things started opening up. There were thousands and thousands of different items that you can 3D print uh, for astronomy purposes. And I thought that was the coolest thing since sliced bread. So I, I thought tonight I'll show you a couple of items, and I'll uh, go into quickly how you would go about you know, 3D printing something and uh, hopefully see the result at the end. But uh, the first thing that uh, I started printing tonight, if you look and you see here on the screen, it's not very big. It's just a little teeny thing. It uh, It's actually a hot shoe that fits on your camera or slides into the hot shoe of your camera, and it's a mini dovetail mount in case you wanted to add, say, a red dot finder to your camera if you were going to do some uh, night imaging and whatnot, then uh, that allows you to use a red dot finder to, to find an object in the night sky and center it in your uh, lens. So I thought that's a cool thing. So how do you go about printing this kind of stuff? 
Well, let me get rid of this screen and I'll share a screen and I'll show you. Just hang on for a second, Mike. Uh, uh, Paul, are you seeing a choppy image from Mike or? Yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Not sure. Not sure why that is, Mike. Uh, it could be because I'm printing at the moment too. I'll try to see if it comes around any better here. Uh, you should see the double cluster in the background. We do. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. And I'll go to this page. There we go. That's clear. Uh, once, yep. once I'm off the screen, then you should be able to see what's on the screen. Perfect. So, uh, not endorsing any websites or, or uh, any vendors or anything like that. Uh, the website that my son took me to that day and I found all, all kinds of goodies on astronomy was called Thingiverse, T-H-I-N-G-I-V-E-R-S-E. And if you go to the top and type in search and type in the word astronomy, you're going to be amazed at the items that you can 3D print for astronomy or if you're into photography, things for your cameras. Uh, it's It's endless. Uh, this item that I have up here right now on the screen, it's just a hot shoe mount for a Celestron red dot finder to mount a red dot finder on your camera, which I thought was pretty cool. So everything on this website is free to download. Uh, it costs you absolutely nothing. You're allowed to use the stuff all you want as long as you don't sell the items that you're printing off. Uh, they have a button right here that says if this is the item you want, you can flip through and take a look at different views of it. Uh, and show what it looks like when it comes to the end print. And then you can actually move it around in 3D and see what it looks like. So if you like that item and you want to print it, you go to Download Files right here, and you click Download. It'll give you a little Dropbox page and whatnot, but it did download the file. There it is coming in right there. So now that you've got your file downloaded... I'm going to reduce this screen. You're going to want to use some software to bring up your 3D printed model. And what I use is Unimaker Cura. It's a, it's a third-party software that works with my Ender 3D printer, and it works very, very well. And you can see right off the bat, it gives you a cube of space in three dimensions. And if I grab my object and pull it over that I downloaded... I can drop it on the screen, and there it is. I can look in all directions and see what it's going to look like when it's finished. Now, this is the, the, the bottom squares here is the actual size of the plate on my printer. My printer is, uh, I can print up to 8 inch by 8 inch. So as long as the object is smaller than 8 inch by 8 inch, I can print it on my printer. So now that I've downloaded it and I've looked at it and said, yeah, that's the item I want, I'm going to click on this button down here at the bottom called Slice. And it's going to process it. And it's going to say, in order for me to print this item, it's going to take two hours and 20 minutes. Now, e printing is not like printing a piece of paper. I call it. Oh, we lost you, Mike. Ooh, you there, Paul? I'm here. Up on your screen. There oh, he is. Mike? Am I still there? Yeah, we lost you for a minute there. Oh, we've lost you again. Okay. Continuing on. And you're still at frozen there, Mike. You can change the settings for your item and go down and you can choose different heights and layers and thickness. Hello? Yeah. I to leave everything at default, except the infill density here. I want to make that 100% because I want to print my item salt. Are we still there, Chris? Uh, yeah, you're, little, you're quite choppy, Mike. We're, we're trying to catch you. Ah. Okay, so I'm going to save that, and I save the file to a zip drive or, or any other file, and that's what I'm going to print on my 3D printer. So I'll close that screen. And I'll pull up this. And if we're still live, you should be looking yeah. at my 3D printer. Yeah, it's that. cool. So there it is in action. So I've sent the object. I've sent the object. Okay. 
I sent it over to the 3D printer. This is already a start on the, the uh, exact object that we were just looking at, that hot shoe. Now, this is about an hour into the print. Uh, you can see on the very bottom down here, it prints a base first. And that base is to keep it so it's stuck to the glass plate. You don't want it lifting off that glass plate. The glass plate is heated to 60 degrees Celsius, and that helps keep the, the, the plastic melted or, or intact. And the extrusion head, if you look at the top here and follow the cable down, this is your PLA or the plastic that I use to print. comes down, goes into a feeder head here, which is a motorized cog that pushes the uh, filament through, comes down to a heated head. The heated head is at 200 degrees Celsius. And then it squirts out a little bit of plastic on each pass, and it just layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, and you end up with the object at the end. The PLA, if anyone is asking what you know, PLA stands for plastic, yes, it is plastic, but it's actually polylactic acid, a type of plastic that is totally biodegradable, and it's made from cornstarch or sometimes out of sugar cane. And when you print with this, particular type, the PLA, there's no smell that comes off it or no toxic fumes that come off it as it's melting and, and pouring onto your screen. So again, this is an item where I would start it, get it running. You see the print's going fine on its own. And I would probably go to bed and wake up the next morning and my print would be finished and my piece would be sitting there. Uh, there are times if... Uh, if a cold gust of wind comes through my door, because I have this sitting beside uh, the door to upstairs, you can see the door here off to the left-hand side. If a cold blast of air comes in, sometimes it'll lift this base off the plate, and that's all it takes. And next thing you know, you wake up and you get yourself a bird's nest in the morning. Not the object that you were hoping to have. <laughs> well, unless you, unless you really like bird's nest. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, uh, I've had very many bird's nests. Uh, the one thing I would say, if you were going to purchase uh, a 3D printer, uh, you know, they're not very expensive. As they're getting out there, and the more and more they get out there, the lower and lower the price gets. I only paid $300 for mine. Uh, again, it'll print up to 10-inch uh, by 10-inch square uh, or cube. It'll 10 inches high, 10 inches wide, and 10 inches tall. Uh, the one thing my son told me, and I believe he was right, is if you're going to buy a 3D printer, make sure you buy one that has a steel frame. There's a lot out there with acrylic frames. There's a lot out there with wooden frames. And they have a tendency to shift as the head moves back and forth, which you will not get uh, as fine a print as you will with a rigid frame metal uh, printer. It will stay solid. And the only parts that move are the parts you want. There's no extra shake. And you won't end up with any artifacts in the object that you print. Can I have a couple of questions here, Mike, or if you don't sure. mind? Okay, so no. Dan, Daniel's asking... Uh, did you have much trouble getting the printer to work properly? I have, uh, I am having terrible trouble with mine. It's a G Tech, a clone of an Ender Three. Says. Uh, I didn't uh, originally. I had a little bit of a problem with the the raft section of the print sticking to the base, and I researched it a little bit, and I bought a piece of plate glass that sits on top, and so the the plate glass will heat evenly. Uh, where your plate only heats in one one area, wherever the little the heat patch is stuck on the bottom, the uh, the glass will grab that heat and spread it out nice and even. And then I found ever since I put the piece of glass down, and I print on top of the glass, it's never been a problem. Great, thank you. Uh, another question from Peter. Peter asks, uh, what is the rough cost of the PLA for this Hoshu project? So let me just uh, stop sharing this screen for a second. I'll go back to. A picture of me from there. Yeah, the PLA there. comes in a box. Uh, it's a one kilogram spool. They come fully packaged and they have a desiccant bag inside. And a one kilogram spool will cost you somewhere between 30 and $35, depending on where you buy it. And that's a one kilogram spool. So this item that I printed here today and the one that's printing now weighs about 50 milligrams. So that's a lot of 50 milligrams in a kilogram spool. <laughs> so for $30, I could probably print a thousand of these and, uh, and still have some PLA left over. Nice. Uh, I buy mine uh, now uh, 
used to buy it on eBay because it was the only place that I could get it. Uh, now there's a shop in town, and they uh, have a, exactly the same printer as mine. And it's going 24-7, but they sell PLA here in the city. So uh, I have a, a good spot where I can just go down and buy it. But the average is about 30 bucks uh, to 35 bucks for uh, one kilo spool. Okay, so Dave McCashin was asking the same thing. How much does the material cost to make your object? So I guess he's, you've answered that question. Uh, yeah, it's literally so pennies. Yeah. And uh, Daniel says uh, he was getting a glass bed was his next uh, plan for his, uh, his uh, printer. That he was uh, having having the trouble with, so he said thanks for the for the info. No, that's that's the way to go. Some people have actually uh, laid macking tape down. That seems to work, but it's awful messy when you're done. The glass just stays there. The heat distributes very evenly, and uh, it makes the printer work very very well. The only thing is, keep your printer away from any drafts that might enter the room. Uh, if you can build a like a box around it. To keep any any drafts from hitting it, uh, you're going to end up with good results 100% of the time. Uh, Emil would like to know if you could build him an astrophysics mount. <laughs> I just asked him for his visa card number so we can build anything. <laughs> he hasn't replied back with the visa number yet, though. Maybe he's going to send it. I bet he's going to send it in a private email. Yeah, I probably could. Uh, like I said, if if it's on Thingiverse, uh, I can print it. There are a lot of uh, guys out there. What they've done, they've taken webcams now. And you put four webcams in a circle and you set the item that you want to scan uh, on a Lazy Susan. You spin it around and take the photographs and that'll convert into 3D files for you. There's software to do that now with, with webcams. And uh, as long as you can scan it, you can uh, come up with the plans to print it. So I haven't gotten that far yet, but uh, <laughs> who knows? Down the road, I might. So Emil's asking, other than finder scope shoes, what other astronomy-related things can you 3D print? I know that was coming up, so. Ah, right up my alley now. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> now that you asked, Emil, yeah. let's start with anybody that owns or has owned uh, the Celestron SE mounts. You've uh, probably found it being a pain to reach around and have to walk around the side of your mount like Chris has behind him mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> and hit the <hand> pad. <laughs> uh, what I found on Thingiverse was this, and it's basically you can take the hand pad off of the telescope, slide it in. Where the hand pad come off, this shuffles in and just sticks there. Now it puts the hand pad at a nice angle facing the back by your eyepiece. You can just look down and hit your buttons, and it's worth its weight in gold, isn't it, Chris? It so sure is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mike, all for that. In the world. Yeah. So that's that's one handy item right there that uh, paid, you know, the 3D printer, as far as I'm concerned, paid for itself. Hmm. As, uh, I don't know who has them out there. You can buy them, but they're in the $70 to $100 range. Yeah. And that was pennies. Yeah. Uh, quickly, if uh, everybody that's owned a Smet Cassegrain or a Daub has probably had a Telrad uh, mounted on their uh, optical tube. And you can 3D print a Telrad base. You can get it uh, so it's curved on the bottom, so that'll fit on top of uh, your optical tube. Or uh, you can print one that's got a flat bottom. Uh, if you wanted to mount that, say, on uh, on a Vixen uh, top rail or something like that, you can set it flat, and you can set your Telrad down into it. I have 3D printed Telrad risers up to 4-inch. So now that if you're, you know, using a Dobsonian telescope and the tail rad's on there, you can lift it up four inches. You don't have to lay your head on the optical tube to, to look up through uh, your tail rad and see where the optic in the sky is. Uh, that, you know, a couple of conveniences right there. Since I was printing tail rad stuff, I thought, wouldn't it be cool? I came across this is a solar finder that bolts onto your tail rad. So you take your tail rad base. The solar finder sets in, you tighten it up, you've got the hole at the front, lets the light through, shines back to a little screen on the back. All I did was take a black marker and make it black, and now you have a solar finder that fits onto your Telrad base for whatever scope your Telrad is sitting on. That was kind of a cool That's setup. Cool. Yep. I wanted to add some fancies to a scope. Uh, they turned out to be, I wanted to have a, a better red dot finder, and I wanted to have a, a laser pointer. Uh, 
but the ones I were looking at came uh, uh, with rifles and gun parts, and they have what's called a Picatinny uh, mount base. And so I went on Thingiverse, and don't they have a riser that I printed has a Picatinny top and a mini dovetail bottom? <laughs> and so now I can take my scope, slide this piece in. And I have a red dot finder with different color reticles or whatever, or different uh, types of reticles instead of just the one. And, of course, the green laser. I don't know if you can see the laser part of it. But <laughs> yeah, sure can. Don't put my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Ow. So, I mean, that was just something that uh, if someone else out there thought, you know, something we can we can mount rifle parts on our telescope for whatever reason. <laughs> yeah. And it turned out to be a darn good idea. Uh, another item that I printed quickly uh, is a mini solar finder. Mm. Slides in the mini dovetail on uh, any scope that you have with a mini dovetail. And, you know, the price of that for a solar finder, if you go on the Soul Searcher, I guess, uh, if you buy one from Teleview, they're about 50 bucks. That's about 30 cents worth of plastic and two hours of your time to print it. Excellent. Some more another, questions. Uh, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, uh, Emil asks, uh, have you seen plans for a Telrad Dew Shield? Uh, I haven't yet, but I haven't looked. Okay. Uh, I'm sure if I go on uh, Thingiverse, uh, one will show up. And if it hasn't, it won't take too long before one does. Yeah. Uh, I started looking for the uh, 8SE uh, hand pad holder, and there wasn't one out there. And uh, it was about three months, and one showed up. And uh, I printed it off right away. Hmm. Here's <coughs> plans for a off mask, Mike? Yes, there's all kinds, but I can only print up to 10 by 10. Yeah. So if I was printing a batten off mask for, say, a four-inch scope or a six-inch scope, uh, not a problem. A C8, I'm pushing it to the limits of my printer. Mm -hmm. But if you buy a printer with a larger base, definitely you can print anything you like. Terrific. Anybody that's ever bought a Skywatcher EQ5 or EQ6 mount and got the uh, GPS to go with it, uh, there's no real place to stick the GPS. Mm -hmm. You've probably taken a piece of Velcro and stuck it on somewhere <laughs> with the wires hanging down. Mm -hmm. I found on Thingiverse, you take your tripod spreader, and this is the piece that holds your GPS, and it clips right into the two-inch eyepiece section of your tripod spreader, and now you have an official permanent holder for the GPS on your Skywatcher mounts. Nice. <laughs> it was a pretty cool. So, wow, nice. And one other last one was everybody that's owned a, a telescope has broken the mount that holds their hand pad. Mm. You know, you're out in the dark, you're out in the cold, things oh, yeah. get broken. So again, with these three, with these spreaders, it just clicks on, and now you've replaced the holder for. <laughs> the one you snapped off in the cold. Yeah, I mean uh, it's endless uh, what you can what you can print with these things. It's up to the imagination. I've gone so far as to print uh, slow motion control knobs for my scope, wow. uh, focus knobs for my Orion scope, and things the smallest things right down to your polar finder cap on your mount. <laughs> I've lost those in the dark and. You know, for about 30 minutes of printing, you get yourself uh, a new polar cap to stick and cover your polar finder on your mount. So, it, again, it's it's endless what you can do with a 3D printer. It's up to your imagination. And uh, go hunting around. Thingiverse is uh, the one that I use. It's the website I go to because everything on it is absolutely free. There's 100 different sites out there you can go to. Uh, you can still download a lot of the free uh STL files, or some places want to charge you a little bit because they were the ones that invented the file and they want to get a little bit of money back for it. I have a tendency to try to find everything for free if I can, and everything on Thingiverse is free. So, you know, there when you're back to, you know, what am I going to do and where do I find my toys and stuff, uh, Thingiverse is a great place to go to get this stuff. 
Uh, I'll just fire my printer back up here and see how it's doing. Let me share my screen again. Sure. Uh, Emil, uh, no, sorry, here, let me see. Uh, Dave McCashin asks, uh, would it be strong enough to make and use a dovetail for a telescope mount? Dave, now that you asked. Let me shop, stop sharing my screen. I was just showing my print is going very well. Nothing's going wrong with it. Oh, I'll just yeah. stop sharing that for a second. One Vixen dovetail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, my printer, I can, uh, in, in this case, I, uh, I printed it. Yeah. It's only eight inches long, but that's, that's as much as my printer base will allow me to go. And I printed it in solid. I mean, you can't break that if you dig. It weighs as light as a feather, and it probably costs uh, $3 worth of PLA plastic to print it. And uh, if you can think of it, you can print it. And that's, uh, you were asking about a dovetail. There's one right there. But if you wanted to put a small refractor on that, uh, it would hold it. And it knocks the weight down. You know, if you have an, an aluminum or a steel uh, Vixen bar on there, this is definitely going to be a lot lighter. <laughs> so it adds, you know, takes that weight off your mount as well. So Lots more questions here, Mike. Uh, uh, Michael Stewart says uh, that the uh, Telrod Dew Shield is actually a work in progress, quote, uh, on thinking verse right now. So um, Peter uh, Visma is asking, uh, what is the connection interface from the printer to the computer? Is it USB? It is USB. Okay. Uh, actually, in my case, uh, I took the USB off because I'm using the USB to run the webcam that's showing the printer right now. Uh, it was a, what do you call them, mini uh, XT or whatever type of... Uh, Oh, yeah. Cards, those are. Yep, yep. XD cards, I guess. Mini SDs, yeah. It's a mini XD. It's a little one that slides into this card. Right. Uh, you pull it out after you download your file onto it and just stick it in. Read through the menu, read the card, your menu comes up, and uh, you find the object you want to print and print away. They are the simplest to simple. Uh, Emil wants to know when you start taking orders for 3D printing jobs. <laughs> well, like I said, anything that I print off Thingiverse, I cannot sell. Uh, there. You know, it's, a, it's a contract that you have with them, just uh, you know, a gentleman's contract to say, I promise I won't sell the stuff that I get off of Thingiverse because you're allowing me to download the items for free and use them at my leisure. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Mike, I noticed that you're using uh, white and black, but if you can get whatever color um, uh, base you want, can you? You get every color of the rainbow. Uh, I even have, I printed, uh, my wife liked uh, the little baby Groot. That's from, from uh, that movie. Well, uh, I printed one in wood filament. It's actually got wood fiber in the filament. And so when I printed this guy, he looks like a little tree. Uh, <laughs> you can get uh, now you can get uh, 3D printers that have three and four extruder heads on them depending on how much you want to pay and you can have a different color for each extruder you can get uh, almost like a, a white metal uh, filament now that you can put through and it will basically print uh, white metal parts for those people that are into Dungeons and Dragons and things like that wow. or you want to make your own chess man or I mean, the sky's the limit. You think about it, if, if you can come up with the idea, I'm sure somebody's got it out there where you can print it. One of my projects now is to print the whole uh, Star Trek 3D chessboard. Oh, and the man. oh wow. It's from the original uh, Star Trek. Yeah. And they have that on Thingiverse as well. Wow. wow. So, uh, Mike, now that you've spent, like, you've, you've, you've had that machine for a couple of years, I think, now? or Yeah, I've had it now for about four, I think. Yeah. Four, okay. And it was around 300 bucks. That's what they are now, or a little bit more than that? Uh, well, it depends. If you buy one like locally here in St. John, uh, it's going to cost you more because he's the only guy that really supplies them. Right. But if you go on eBay or go on to one of these places that, uh, like in Ontario that sells them, you can get them as cheap as you want. Uh, yeah. I've seen one arm 3D printers down as low as 110 bucks. Okay. Any any regrets with the one that you purchased? or None at all. No? It's doing everything that I wanted to do. I just, uh, the only regret is, yeah, I wish it was a little bit bigger so I could, you know, print bigger things like a full size. Uh, solar filter. Uh, Which you have uh, done. You've done solar filters inch. before. You've done solar I've filters. I've done it for four yeah. inch and I've done it for six inch, but it would be kind of nice to be able to do them for an eight inch. Mm, okay. Let me see if there's any but No, no regrets stuff. on the printer itself whatsoever. It just takes a lick and it keeps on ticking. Oh, they're absolutely, they're wonderful uh, things to have. And I mean, just me, I lose eye, eyepiece caps constantly. 
And so for me, just to, to try to find the ones that fit, uh, <coughs> like I use the Celestron Ultima uh, eyepieces, the LX, the two two inch ones, and they're almost impossible to find anywhere. Like things like that are, um, if they if they were on Thingiverse, and they probably are, you know, you could you could print and have uh, have extras for sure. Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. they're on there. Like the only thing is, is time. Right. Uh, you know, the most objects take one to two hours. I printed a skull for my wife, a full size human skull, because she wanted one. And it took 56 hours. And the whole 56 hours, I was like going, <laughs> and I was hoping that like, a cold breeze didn't hit it and mess up the printing. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. But uh, yeah, that's. Uh, it's, it's the go-to-bed printer. You start your object printing, go to bed, and when you wake up in the morning, hopefully it's there and not a bird's nest. <laughs> and if it's a bird's nest, you got to uh, look at selling them like to a greenhouse store or something like that. Yeah, Great. that would probably work too. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, Mike. Thanks very much for that. Anybody else with any questions before we sign off for Mike? If you do have any questions, just uh, put them up on here on YouTube. I'm watching the live stream, and uh, I can always go back to Mike and ask him uh, to comment back on, on anything in there anyway. I have a question for Mike. Sure. sure. What are you going to do with all those bird's nests? <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. You have pictures of birds, Paul. Maybe I'll bring them out to your place for you. Sure. <laughs> awesome. All right. So thanks, Mike, for that. Excellent, excellent talk. And uh, awesome. an excellent yeah. topic. And uh, I'm going to get myself one of them, too, very soon. So we're going to switch over to, uh, to Paul now. And uh, maybe I'll get you to stop sharing, Mike, if you can. Uh, absolutely. It, okay. Thanks a bunch, sir. There. I am not sharing. And let's click on Paul. Hey, Paul. Hey. Uh, says um, Dave and Cash. Just one last comment, I guess. Dave and Cash says Michael sells glass cases that might stop the breeze issue. So there. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. The printer will fit into it. It's there easier to use a couple of pieces of plywood, though. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Okay, Paul's going to talk on some camera use to say, Paul. Well, yeah. Uh, before I do, though, um, yeah. oh, we've got that. Got to catch up with Rosanna for the week. Yes. So um, let me just share my screen, and while I do that, you can do your famous. Oh, do we not have um, any? Do we not have anything yet? We don't have any music yet. <laughs> no, not yet. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> so here it comes. Here comes. Dun, 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 dun. Rosanna's fun <laughs> fact. <laughs> That's my only. That's you know some. That is worth the segment to me. That's the only part of my whole show. That's the only thing I do. (laughs) (laughs) And I I practice it all week. Print. Can Mike? Can you? Can you three D print us or something maybe for that? I probably can. (laughs) (laughs) We do sound printing pretty soon. I bet you. So, um, so for this week in Rosanna's Fun Facts, just a really quick one, actually, and, and I'm just going to hope for that I can find the things I need to find to do it, but here we go. So um, Rosanna says that M15, although to many people M15 means several types of, um, of guns, and let me just pop it <laughs> over here. There we go. So it says, yeah, so several types of guns, uh, which there's different pistols, there's rifles, even a machine gun, and possibly um, a computer. Yeah, M15 is also the name of a computer alienware. for alienware, but to astronomers, of course. Now, let me just get rid of that and that. <laughs> I had to kind of do a little juggling here for this today. And, and i got to find that other one here now. So M15 actually to astronomers, of course, is a glorious globular cluster that surprisingly contains among it 30,000 stars, 112 variable stars, and nine known pulsars, and one of which is a double neutron star. So that's basically what um, Rosanna was telling us this week on M15, so it's got many, many different names and many different uh, things that it can be. But to us astronomers, of course, it's a glob. Nice. And glob season is coming up pretty soon, so. That's right. Yeah. And there's one other little one that she sent. And I thought this one was kind of cool. Let me see if I can find the image. Here it is. Oh, I've got so much stuff open here now. There we go. Can you all see that? Mm. Yeah. So 
she says, although there is a speculation that the ancient Mayans described the smudge of M42 in Orion, and of course, we all know what the smudge is. It's right down there in the belt, or in the sword, rather. So um, this smudge at M42 in Orion, it is not mentioned by Galileo, Ptolemy, or Sufi. I think it's Sufi or Sufi. I could be pronouncing that wrong. It is generally accredited to a French astronomer, Fabry de uh, Piercic, in 1610 with the first publication of its observing coming in 1619 by John Baptiste uh, Syset. And with the non-existent light pollution of many years ago, it's hard to imagine that little smudge of Orion Nebula was never noted before that. Isn't that something, eh? So that's uh, Orion. And for those who don't know what that little smudge is, well, that little smudge, if I can find it, is the Orion Nebula. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. So that is this week's version of... Rosanna's Fun Facts. Thanks again, Rosanna, for your input. We love it. <laughs> 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 Overture, turn the light. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> Night of nights. <clears throat> <laughs> okay, so now I got to get off uh, this stuff and figure out how to get me back on the screen here. I'm there somewhere. I know I am. Oh. Uh, let me just turn off all the stuff I don't need. And uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. This is why we're live. I'm lost. <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> we can't even pause for a commercial, Paul. Yeah. Okay. Let me just see if I can get rid of a whole bunch of stuff that I know what I'm not using and see if I can't find myself again. All right. Hangouts. I'm should, I should be on Hangouts. Oh, there we go. Can I stop sharing? There yep, I am. There you are. Yep. Am I back? Yes, you're here. Hey. Hey. Oh, there's you. I'll make it big. There. Can you, can you see me? I can see you. We can All right. You. <laughs> can you hear me now? <laughs> can you hear me? <laughs> okay, so this week um, I wanted to just do really, really briefly a really quick rundown on um, how to choose or how to start thinking about choosing um, – I guess let's look at the camera. Hey. Hey. How to choose um, a camera and a telescope for the job at hand. And um, that can be – that can open up quite a, quite a can of worms. And um, because when I started thinking about it, I thought, well, okay, so what's the first thing that we have to recognize is what is, what is it that we want to image? Like, what do we want to take a picture of? And um, so a lot of people think, well, geez, I know I like to take a picture of the moon. That's yeah, that would that that would make that would make a good sense. Okay, so if I'm going to take a picture of the moon, what am I going to need for um, a telescope? First of all, um, most every telescope that's out there will give you a good picture of the moon a good size picture of the moon and uh but the camera that you choose could be the issue that either will or will not let you um take that image and i want to show you a couple of things so let me get this thing off here can you see this camera so what i wanted to show you was there's different types of cameras that are out there there's um the little um ones that have probably everybody's seen now, ZWO have taken the astronomy world by storm over the last few years, and uh, everybody has uh, ZWO cameras now. So this one here is the uh, ASI-120. Mike has a smaller version of this with another brand, I believe, and but it's essentially the same sensor and all that stuff. And it's a great little planetary camera, but I want you to look at the size of that sensor. Can you see that in there? Hmm. Is it focus or is it out of focus? Yeah, no, it's good. It's good? Okay. Yeah. So um, so that's basically what they call a planetary camera, and you can use it for planetary um, work. You can put a little um, uh, lens that comes in. It's almost like a fisheye lens that comes with it and use it for uh, an all-sky camera. Or you can screw it on the back, like this one up here is, and then use it for a guiding camera. So it's got many, many differences. But the biggest thing to note about it when you're trying to match it to a telescope is that physical size of the sensor. And that's a very, very small sensor. So on the other side of the scale, <clears throat> there's cameras that are designed for, um, for deep space work. And 
you know, they're designed to take much, much wider swaths of the sky and designed to be used with telescopes that give a wider field of view, really. Oh, well, you can use them on, on all, all fields, but so if you look at that, can you see the size of the sensor there? Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, so when you look at the two of them, I mean, it's like day and night, the size of those two sensors. And uh, that plays a really, really big part in what is it that you want to do with your camera and what kind of telescope are you going to buy and then what kind of camera is going to work with that telescope. Those are just a couple of the cameras. And there's, a, there's a whole bunch of cameras out there, but those are probably the two most common size chip sets that you'll see. Basically a three-quarter uh, three sensor, um, a, your APS-C size, which is what you have on your um, – oh, right here – what you have on your DSLR cameras. And the, this particular camera has the same size sensor. This is, they're both APS-C. So they're both very big sensors. Uh, the other camera I have out in, uh, in my observatory is a ZWO-294. And it's got what they call a four third sensor. So it's just a little bit smaller than, our, than this, um, this camera and that CCD camera. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen again, if I can find myself here. <laughs> And I'm going to show you something. Um, that's not that's the screen. That's the screen I want to uh, share. Okay. So if I um, – can, can you see Solarium there now? Yeah. Yep. You can? Okay, good. So what I want to show you here um, is just sort of what I would go through if I was trying to figure out how, what can I see with that sensor with my particular telescope. So if you look up here in the top corner, um, there's a whole there's four little icons. One is for ocular. So if you want to, if you had a telescope and you wanted to see um, how much can I see with my eyepiece in my telescope, well then you just press that button there. It'll go to oculars, and then depending on the type of um, object that you're what you're going to want. Right now I'm not looking at an object, so it's not giving me anything. Let's say if I want to do bay. And then you can basically just turn this on and then you can put on like I will have a I'm going to use a 40 millimeter plossel and it's going to be um, in whatever kind of telescope. And this one here, for example, is a Mead LX200. So it's an eight inch F10. So it's a pretty powerful scope. So basically based on that eyepiece and that telescope, that's what you'll see. Well, the same thing happens with the cameras. If I go back to sensors, let's say, for example, we want to search something else. We'll just search window and let's go to M81. And there it is right there. So based on this camera, which is an EOS 450D, which is the, basically what I have there and what most people's Canon cameras are, are the uh, APS-C size sensor. And then I'm using a 10-inch Mead, 8-inch uh, uh, smith Cassegrain, which is what a lot of people have. And this one here, I've got a focal reducer on. I'm going to take that focal reducer off. So there's none. So if you look at that red square and you look at the item that's inside of it, that's how big that particular um, telescope will give you an image to match with that particular sensor that's in your camera. Now, if I turned around and I said, you know what, uh, what would that little planetary camera do for me? Let's just take a look. So let's just scoot right up to that little camera, and it's called a ZWO120. And if I fly past it, please stop me. There it is there. So... Yeah. <laughs> Wow. So now you can see that, that that particular little red camera that I had in my hand is not going to do that. And never mind that it's a planetary camera. That's a whole other topic, but I didn't want to get into that. I just wanted to get into this basically scaling things up properly. That camera is not going to work um, with that telescope for that particular target, even if it was a deep space, but you'll never have deep space camera that small a sensor. But, um, but you can see if I'm doing planets even, um, you know, this scale is going to uh, take into play. So let's say, um, let's, let's look at a planet. Let's go look for, say, uh, Venus. Jupiter. Let's go to Jupiter. It's even better. Jupiter. And we'll find Jupiter. Now it's going to tell me that, there it is right there. There. So if you look at the sensor that I'm using right now, this ZWO camera, that little tiny one we use for guiding our telescope and, and, and whatnot, Jupiter actually is fitting in there quite nicely. I can't get all the moons in, of course, but I can get um, Jupiter itself, 
which is which is actually quite a good scale because I could take that image and I can blow that up and have a really really nice you know or crop it in and have a really really nice uh, Jupiter. If I wanted to put a Barlow on my telescope, so I'm using still using an LX200, but I'm going to put a Barlow on my scope. So let's let's double the size of that. Now look how much space Jupiter takes in that frame. So you can see that if I'm if I'm going to do planetary work, why that little sensor is exactly what I'd want to use. Then you might say, well, but wouldn't I want to use a bigger sensor? Well, no, and I'm going to show you why. Because if I go to a bigger sensor, let's go to that um, ZWO294 or my DSLR. Look how small Jupiter is in that frame now. So you can see by the time I crop that in and blow that up, I'm not going to have a whole lot of resolution to work with when I get it to the size that I want it to be. Because, again, that sensor is so much larger. So I being crop in and you can see now to get it to that point I wouldn't have enough pixels in there to give me a really really clean image because it's just too small so it's not going to work very well so um, so those are the are two of the considerations um, to take when you're um, considering the size of your chip and your in your telescope um, the other thing I want to mention on this is that there's what they call a scale and there's a calculator let's see if I can find that for us and it's called an image scale calculator and you can go on to uh, cloudy nights to find it you can go on to um, any of these other uh, uh, astronomy sites um, um, uh, star Arizona has got a really really good one but anyway all you do here is you just put in the information that you're dealing with and it'll give you what they call an image scale and in most image scales in, in and around the area that we live here um, where we've got the skies are really not great in terms of seeing. Uh, we want to keep our image scale between, say, one and two. That's where we want to keep it. And that'll give us a really good um, a maximum use out of our telescope and our camera size together. So what you do in a case like this, if I'm using that ZWO camera, <clears throat> excuse me, like um, the uh, 294, the one with the larger chip for deep sky, the pixel size on it is or 4.63 microns. The focal length that I'm dealing with on that telescope, let me put that in there. Right now, uh, it's, it's native focal length is 2,000 millimeters. And then the width of my chip, of my uh, amount of my pixels for width is 4, 4188, and the height of them is 2288. Then all I have to do once I've got that in there, I just press calculate, and that gives me my scale. So you can see here that my scale, this is like, probably not real great because it's such a low number, which means that I'm going to be really, really making that image huge. And I may not get the best um, uh, out, of the, out of the image. The other thing to consider with that number is, is when you're guiding, like if you're doing deep space um, photography, you have to use a little telescope that kind of guides and locks onto a star and it keeps your mount um, uh, tracking within a certain amount of error. So the smaller that number is here, then the more the, uh, uh, the more work you're going to put onto your telescope mount. Because if you're not, if you're new to astrophotography, you don't want to use image scale like this because you'll never ever get round stars. That's going to try. It's going to give you um, tracking uh, issues that you can see. And it's kind of like when you go back to um, Scalarium. I just want to show you this. If I shrink this down. And I put that right on Jupiter. I'll put Jupiter right in the center. And I'm going to make it just big enough that you can see it. There. So I put that in the center. And you see how fast that's moving off center? So your mount has to track it that fast. And at this scale, um, you know, that's pretty, you know, it's moving quickly. So if I was to zoom it in, like your camera actually sees it to 100% scale, look how fast Jupiter's moving. So I've got to really make sure that my scope is, you know, is, is the, the, the polar alignments bang on and I'm getting an excellent guiding. Otherwise, I'm going to have a hard time with this kind of movement. But if I go to a much smaller scale, let's go to um, a different telescope. Let's go to uh, there, 105 millimeter telescope. Now, I'm, I got the crosshairs right on Jupiter. And look at Jupiter, it's, it's not moving. So that means with this scale, um, 
the uh, the workload that's on my mount is a lot less, which means my guider doesn't have to be as accurate, which means I can go up to a higher um, guide rate. So if my if I'm only guiding at say one or somewhere thereabouts, it doesn't make any difference because the scale that you're looking at here is going to be somewhere around probably two. So the higher the number it is, the easier it is uh, for your tracking. So if you're just new to this kind of stuff and you kind of think, okay, I want to buy a telescope and I want to buy a camera. Um, the scale of which they work with each other is a really, really important thing to factor in, not only for the resolution and getting the quality out of it, but in terms of your success, uh, getting nice round stars in your, in your uh, astrophotography journey. So um, that's pretty much all I want to mention on this because it's a topic you could spend, you know, we spend years you know, researching it. But anyway, I'll stop sharing and I'll try to find me again. Somewhere up there. <laughs> You're there. Somewhere. That's your pretty face. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> hey, thanks, Paul. That was yeah, excellent. so that's just a little bit about camera scale and stuff. So there you are. Uh, Robert is asking, if your res was 6,000 by 4,000, what is that number? If you're six, if you're, what is it now? He's saying if your res was 6,000 by 4,000, what is that number? I'm not sure what he's referring to there. Maybe Robert can... Um, I'm not sure. I know like when, when I'm looking for, um, uh, specs on the cameras and matching them up with the scopes, what I'm looking for is, um, this is the pixel count on my sensor. So for example, on that ZWO camera, the one that I have in the observatory, mm -hmm. it's uh, 41, 88, uh, wide by 28, 22 high. So that would be my total pixel count. And then the size of the actual pixels um, are 4.63 microns. So each one is about 4.63 microns large. Those are the things that you need to know when you're matching it up to the telescope. And then you'd put in the, basically the telescope's focal length and that'll give you your scale. And Daniel mentions a uh, very cool Stellarium can simulate telescopes. That's, that is cool. Yeah, it, yeah. it is. It is. And uh, the nice thing about it is, is if you want, and I was doing it earlier today, but if you wanted to go on, I was looking at the moon. And if I wanted to actually dig right into the moon and look at various, various um, uh, spots on it, rather than the whole disk, you can simulate whatever that you want. So if you've got an F10 scope and a two times Barlow and a small um, um, uh, sensor, uh, it's amazing what you can do just by taking uh, very small pictures at high resolution and then put together a mosaic and you can come up with an absolutely stunning um, uh, lunar image. Just amazing. But yeah. Paul, so much, so much material in that. Uh, we we got to get into more talks about, uh, about cameras and telescopes and accessories for sure. And uh, yeah. more, more of your stuff. Uh, you've, uh, you really, uh, showed a part there that's really important for people to learn. And uh, if you're getting into astrophotography at all, you're the guy to, to uh, pass on the information for sure. So thanks very much for that. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Okay, so uh, I guess um, maybe I'll spin back to myself and uh, I was going to try to maybe offer a bit of what's up in our sky for March because we're getting close to the end of our time here. I guess we've got about seven minutes or so left. So thanks again, Paul, for that. Oh, you're and, welcome. Uh, we'll... Uh, Try to share my screen. And I'm going to screw this one. And I'm going to see if I can bring up the presentation I got here. I'll have to drag it over to my screen. Yeah, just get bear with me for a second. Get this going right. All right, uh, display settings. Switch, swap views. There, how's that? Looks good. Yeah. Okay. So welcome What's to March, everybody. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that later on. Uh, welcome to uh, the March, everybody. March first, of course, and uh, a week from today we spring forward. So uh, let's just take a look at a few things that are happening this month. There, it is kind of a really nice month for for planetary and uh, moon alignments coming up this month. So I'm going to spin right into it here. Of course, uh, our our view of our moon taken from the LRO spacecraft, and that spacecraft has been orbiting the moon now for, I guess, nine years, or a little bit better than that. Uh, what it did was it stitched all these images together to produce this high-res uh, movie for us. So we never do get to see the back side of the moon like that, the, or the far side of the moon. This is the side coming up here that we always see. So just a little bit of view of, of uh, our moon from 
NASA's LRO spacecraft, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, taking high-definition photos of the moon in preparation for the next moon landings, which will take place, uh, we're told, in 2024. And the first uh, female astronaut will be there walking on the moon, which is really cool. Wow. So, if we if we had a clear sky tonight, this is what we would have. Uh, if we were looking southwest tonight at 8 o'clock, um, of course, we get brilliant Venus there on the southwest sky. Venus is the third brightest object in the sky behind the sun and the moon. And uh, it's going to be in our night sky for quite a while yet. I'm going to show you a little bit of a video here that shows uh, its orbit and uh, how much longer we're going to get a chance to see it. Of course, the waxing crescent moon here tonight, not quite uh, first quarter. That'll be coming up in a day or so. Uh, it's sitting up beside the, the beautiful Pleiades cluster there, uh, which is uh, called the Seven Sisters, I guess, and some, some people have called it that. Uh, a lot of people think it's a, a little dipper, but or they call it a mini dipper. But it's a beautiful cluster of about 40 stars, uh, 40 to 100 stars, I guess, that are passing through the Milky Way. They're very young, uh, beautiful blue-white uh, stars. Off to the left-hand side, there's Aldebaran. That's a huge uh, red giant star. And they're going to show you a picture of that compared to the sun here in a second. And then we have Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse, whatever you like to call it, uh, the top left corner of... Uh, Orion, which of course has been the focus uh, over the last little while about uh, it uh, dimming and brightening again. Apparently it's back to its brightening phase again now, so I guess that was just a dip. It wasn't the fact that uh, we had uh, we were going to see a supernova at any time soon, so in the, in the next uh, 100,000 years, I guess, sometime along there, just around the corner in, in uh, space terms. Uh, and then we have blue-white Rigel down at the bottom right-hand side, and then uh, of course Sirius, which is the brightest star in our, in our sky. Uh, sitting off there with Canis Major. So let's spin off a little bit farther and we showed you Aldebaran in that last slide up here in the corner right off beside uh, the waxing moon. If we were to take our Sun, our, our, our planet Earth, I don't know if you can see my mouse on the screen or not there guys. Yeah. Yeah okay so there's there's Earth in comparison to uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth. There's our planets all lined up and there's uh, Jupiter which we could fit a thousand Earths inside of, and there's Earth to our compared to our Sun. So uh, 109 Earths would fit across the diameter of the Sun. This might be a little bit out of scale. Um, and then if we took our Sun and compared it to Aldebaran, there's Aldebaran in comparison to our Sun. So Aldebaran would go out and swallow the planets Mercury, Venus, Earth, and most likely the asteroid belt at the same time. And uh, if we stepped a little bit farther than that, then we've got here's our Sun. Here's Sirius, that bright star that we see in the in the uh, southern sky in the evenings. There's Pollux, that's one of the stars of Gemini, of course. Uh, Castor and Pollux, the two heads of Gemini, which is a, another uh, orange giant star. We have Arcturus here, another red giant. Rigel, um, Aldebaran again. And uh, compare Aldebaran to Betelgeuse. Look at the difference here. Wow. So yeah, Betelgeuse actually Jupiter would be inside Betelgeuse if we were if we had. Betelgeuse setting the same location as our sun. And of course, Betelgeuse is not the biggest one. Antares is even larger than that. And we have a few stars that are actually larger than that again. Uh, the largest star, I, I think, is a, a VY uh, Cephei now. Um, it was Canis Majoris just for a little while, VY Canis Majoris. Uh, Canis Majoris, I know I read a piece on it that if you were to fly around that star once, it would take you 1,142 years, one trip around. So I'm talking about some pretty massive objects here. Anyway, just want to point out uh, Aldebaran and where it was in the sky. And uh, again, this is this one here and uh, how, how big it is when you're looking at these stars. Of course, they appear pinpoints of light, but they're very far away. And uh, March on the 9th of March, uh, we've got our supermoon month. So this is the first of three consecutive supermoons coming up. Uh, and a supermoon is uh, described as a new or a full moon that's closely coinciding with perigee, which means that's the closest point to Earth in its monthly orbit. So it's always a, a full moon that is within 10% of perigee. That's uh, the description of it. So we will have a supermoon coming up on uh, March the 9th. Uh, the supermoon term really doesn't mean anything, doesn't mean anything to the IAU or, or astronomical uh, uh, preference at all, but all it is is, is basically a, a name that was given to it. Um, the moon appears uh, slightly larger than a normal moon. Um, whether you would remember, though, from the month before, how big the moon was to uh, that particular month is, is hard to say. 
basically said, I have to remember where the full moon was coming up at that point, and uh, does it look exactly the same size? The bigger part of this is really called the moon illusion, and we can get into that talk maybe, uh, maybe next week when we get into the full moon, on um, why the moon looks so big at the horizon. And it is a, a trick that your brain uh, plays on you, so we'll just leave it at that, and hopefully I'll, I'll, uh, I'll bring up that little bit of a talk next week. So skipping off from March the 9th to the full moon phase until we get into March the 16th. Now we're going to get some really nice uh, planetary lineups here going. So we get the third quarter moon that sits uh, just off the coast of Sagittarius there. And we know we all know Sagittarius as being uh, the spot where uh, it looks like a teapot in the sky. You can see the lid of the teapot here and the body below it. And there's the handle of the teapot and here's the spout. And coming out of the spout, all that steam, we call it the Milky Way. But, of course, that's just that's just coming from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The center is somewhere up around here. And we're 26,000 light years from the center, so we see this big band passing across the sky. We, we normally see it uh, in the evenings. You can actually pick it up in the morning sky if you're up early enough. This is at 6 a.m. before the sunrise. So the moon is sitting up in that area, third quarter moon on the 16th. Uh, so it's heading down to a waning crescent phase. And if we look at there, we've got uh, Mars, uh, Jupiter, and Saturn all lined up in our morning sky. Now, Mars and Jupiter are getting a lot closer together, and we're going to see as uh, the days move on here. Here's our waiting crescent again, and Mars and Jupiter on the 17th. So the moon is moving over. Every night it's uh, rising up about an hour later. If we get into March 18th, this is a really nice triplet sitting here now. So we've got Jupiter, Mars, both uh, very close together, and then the moon sitting directly below them. So very nice. Uh, if you're looking at a photo opportunity, mark that date down, March the 18th, 6 a.m. in the morning. Everybody's up at 6 o'clock anyway, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, even if it's a Sunday or Saturday. Um, so there it is uh, at uh, at uh, 6 a.m. on March the 18th. Really nice uh, opportunity for a photo right there. And Saturn just sitting off to its left as well. Um Moving ahead a little bit more, we can see that Jupiter and Mars are getting much closer together. We have Jupiter, Saturn, and our little bit of a, a waning crescent moon hanging down on the next night, on the next morning, I should say. And when we get into the 20th, uh, little Mercury joins the show. Now, that's going to be very difficult to pick up. Uh, we're just at 6.45 there, so we're already into the time that we've, we've moved ahead the hour, and uh, we're into another, another uh, week or two uh, past that. So Mercury's going to be... Uh, Drifting up in our in our uh, in our southeastern sky very early in the morning, but uh, be tough to be able to pick it up. You might get it with binoculars, and uh, you'll see that nice uh, waning crescent moon though sitting there, the little sliver of moon, along with Saturn. And look at how close Jupiter and Mars appear to be. Wow. So let's move ahead. I uh, just got a couple of slides left here. I just want to show this little bit of a movie that I made just from Stellarium, uh, showing the uh, position of the planets. At 5:30 in the morning, and you're going to see the time move ahead here. There's the time move to hit to 6:30. So, but watch, watch how these uh, planets all tend to flow around the course. There, plant the word planet is Greek for the word wanderer. So you can see how Ju uh, Mars was sitting beside Jupiter. Now it's past Saturn, and you'll see the three of them all line up this way now. Over at wow. the end of, so, by the by the middle of April, there'll be Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. So that moves that quickly in the sky. One more time through it. So we got Mars on the right, Jupiter in the center, and Saturn on the low left. And watch as Mars uh, starts to move. Of course, it's Jupiter and Saturn that are moving the most there. And we're, we're, we're moving around the, the, uh, the sun a lot quicker, so they're getting dragged behind us, but we're not moving around uh, much far, much quicker than Mars is. So, And there's a nice end up at uh, on the April 15th when we have the moon joined with all three of them. Uh, one last slide is just to uh, show the position of Venus. So Venus, is we don't want to forget for that one, that's out in our southwestern sky now in the evenings. Of course, we've all seen this really bright star sitting up there, and that's the, the planet Venus. Um, and it'll be there for a while yet because here's the orbit of Venus. And uh, I'm going to move this ahead a little bit. We're going to see that it's going to get, uh, I think it's on the 24th of this month that it is actually at the, its eastern elongation, which means it's the farthest east in the sky that it can go, and then it'll start dropping on the side again. So let's run through a little bit of a movie here with, with Venus. We're at March the 1st right now, today's date. And we can see it moves up there right up until about the 24th, where we get at the very top. And we 
we're into April now. So we well, that have it. Pallades? What's that? Did that go through Pallades? I think it did. Let's go back and yeah. take a look. Yes, yes, it is. What an incredible shot that would be. Let's take a look here. Not very close. Oop. What happened there? Hang on. <laughs> we'll try again. Yes, it did. Look at that. Boom. Oh, yes. Right yeah. Yeah, it does. oh, wow. Nice. So I'm not sure exactly when that was. One more time, quickly. There's an opportunity for a photograph. Absolutely. Wow. So, yeah, it's right there, right around the 3rd or 4th of April. And then yes, see sir. how quickly it spins down. Watch how quickly we lose it now, though. Boom. By by mid May, uh, it's it's gone in our uh, in our daytime uh, or our sunset sky. So, so we still got a good month at least, and it's going to get even higher than it is right now. So we've got lots of time. Once it's way up high like that, uh, we've got a few hours before it disappears. Uh, it was quite late, I think, last night around 11 or so before it actually disappeared from our horizon. So, so keep an eye out for Venus. Uh, for the next little while and watch out for it around the third or fourth of april i guess we'll see if it uh, we can get it up through uh, the pleadies yeah that'd be cool and that's about all i got for this month that's uh, that's part of the show i know there's more out there but I'll, I'll be posting more of this out on my my facebook page my instagram page as well so um let me clear that out uh you should be able to do it this way and that's what i think there, we're back. Screen sharing. I'll stop sharing my screen. And I should come back. There we go. There we are. There, guys. Ta -da. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's a few things to watch for over the next uh, next week or so. Um, it, well, mostly it's a, it's a morning planet event uh, with the moon as well. I mean, we've we got a, a full moon now coming up again on uh, on the 9th, the first super moon of three. And then after that, the waning uh, crescent moon joins uh, the planets in the early morning sky. So you can get up early enough now and take a look out in the morning sky, and you will see the three planets lined up. So it does it does give you a little bit of a sense of where we sit in, in our solar system, because now when you're looking out, you're seeing that ecliptic line. That's a line that the planets uh, seem to take as they orbit the sun. And if you look out that way, you're really looking out to see three planets in, in our same plane as we are. So that gives you an idea. We're tilted at that 23 and a half degree angle. So we're looking out and seeing the planets in the same line as we are. So that does help to, to give some perspective of where we are in the solar system. Uh, with that, I guess uh, we're going to call this a show for tonight. Um, that was a lot of fun, guys. Good night tonight. It yeah. It's galaxy season. It is galaxy season. That's the other thing we have to mention. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so remember that, Paul. Because <laughs> Paul I'm to loves, in my head. <laughs> Paul loves to get reminded about galaxy season. Yeah, I mean, we'll be able to get into the Leo triplet if you're if you if you have a telescope at all. Look towards the tail of Leo, and between the tail of Leo and uh, the head of Virgo, uh, through the evening. And if you point your telescope anywhere there, you're going to run into a galaxy. They may not appear these big bright spiral arms that you would see from a Hubble shot, but you'll see these little smudges all through your open i've i've had anywhere from three to eight in in an eyepiece at once in a 32 millimeter through through a large daub it's amazing to see that many galaxies all together and it's what we call the realm of the galaxies that's an area of this guy i've been trying to get paul to shoot sometime <laughs> <laughs> well actually so, I've, I've worked on some targets so i, I got some got some for you this year perfect great so we'll start with the Leo triplet. I mean, that's where the moon's going to sit. Uh, I think it's on the uh, 11th or so. The moon's going to sit around uh, the Leo triplet, just below it. But then as as uh, Leo starts to rise a little bit higher, we are getting into galaxy season. And then shortly after that comes the globular season that would I uh, I'd really look forward to, the summer globs and stuff. And uh, we've got a really nice summer of planets coming up with Jupiter and Saturn in our southern horizon all summer long. So a really nice uh, season to come out to our telescopes, uh, take a look through the eyepieces. Uh, we do have a workshop coming up, Paul. I want to mention that again, I guess, uh, in the Hampton area, if anybody's in the Hampton area or in the St. John area as well that would like to attend the, the, the uh, workshop in Hampton. Uh, we're putting on a new uh, workshop. It's called the Beginner's Astronomy Workshop, where uh, myself and Paul and uh, Mike will be offering uh, talks on, on the night sky. Uh, I'll be doing an introduction to the night sky myself, uh, Paul will be doing a talk on cameras and uh, accessories, how to shoot the night sky with uh, with uh, um, cameras and how to shoot the moon and the Milky Way, that type of thing. 
Mike will be doing a talk on equipment, and then our final night will be a kind of a, a mix of everything. So it's over four nights. Uh, the first Wednesday night will be on March the 11th, um, and it's from 7 till 9 o'clock. It's at the Lincoln Center, is that right, Paul? Uh, the Lighthouse Center. Lighthouse yeah. Center, sorry. Lighthouse yeah, Center. Yeah, right down by yep. the Green Bridge. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah. and, it's, and it's free. So uh, if you're in the area and you'd like to come up and learn a little bit more about the night sky, and uh, we're, we're going to be there to, uh, to help, uh, help you understand it. So that's coming up starting on March the 11th. And with that, I guess, guys, we'll call it a night. I uh, want to thank everybody for joining on with us tonight. Uh, again, if you, uh, if you haven't subscribed to the page, please do. And if you enjoyed the content that was here with you tonight, uh, please give us a little bit of a like. We like that. And uh, if you have any other comments along the way, don't forget, too, that uh, we didn't have a photos of the week uh, this, this week because I didn't receive any photos. But if you do have some photos to send along, please uh, send them along, and we'll, uh, we'll certainly focus on those next week. We'll, we'll bring them up uh, as part of our segment next week. So until next week, uh, I'll say uh, good night to Mike. And... Keep your scope pulling it up. <laughs> One more time, Mike. Keep your scope on it up. There you go. <laughs> and Polly. <laughs> and guys, thanks a lot. And thanks everybody out there in uh, YouTube land for, for joining us uh, once again. We're going to be, uh, again, we're only going to have a couple of weeks left uh, before the night skies uh, take us take us down for the season. So hopefully you come back and join us again next week. And we're hoping to build up on a finale uh, coming up very soon. Take care, folks. Thanks a lot. And have a great week. Good night, everybody. And keep your scopes pointed up. Mm-hmm. <laughs>